Okay, so I'm going to give you a, you guys a lecture on the French Lieutenant's Woman because this gives us a little bit more time, kind of doubles, doubles our time together. So uh, we've already had a look at chapter one, so some of what I'm going to say will refer back to that conversation. So just to recap on, on Tess, we've already examined a novel that's inescapably a product of the era in which it was written. Um, and we've all agreed on that. So whether we decide it's through protest, in which case it sets itself apart from the dominant values of the time, or with it, or both, as some of you have said, we can see that Thomas Hardy is speaking specifically to the period in which he's writing. So he's a Victorian writer writing to the Victorian period. So, of course, there's things in the novel that seem to speak universally to us, men, women, life, death, justice, and its definition, and all of those things. All those subjects human beings can't seem to leave alone no matter what time that they live in. Um, but we do see Hardy's particular fascination with these subjects as particularly Victorian. So we've also noticed that some particularly Victorian ways of writing quite beyond the subjects of interest appear throughout the novel. So we've got the intrusive narrator keeps coming up, um, reminding us how to think, what to know, crafting our position to suit his agenda. He wants us to see Tess as hard done by, and so he positions us with her and behind her, and he even lectures us at times about how to read her. He comes out of the action and sharpens our attention to exactly where he'd like it to be. So what do we make of a novel written in 1969, which is set in the Victorian era, but, is which, but, but which is not written from the Victorian era? Um, and at times it even sounds like it's Victorian. Of the subject matter, we can see similarities. Both novels are interested in Victorian notions of purity, especially of sexual purity. Both novels are interested in the hypocrisy which that generates. Both novels also play with genre, as we've discussed the introduction of the three chapters in that, sorry, the three characters in that first chapter, two women and one man, immediately invites us to see the action as in involving some complication in that relationship. So we're already immediately thinking of some form of romance, just as we do with Tess in that opening chapter where Tess sees Angel for the first time. Um, and as some of you have previously noted, those carefully crafted sentences seem very Victorian, with sometimes three or four clauses at one time, and they're remin reminiscent of that muscular type of Victorian sentence that we became so used to with Hardy. Now, that omniscient author also seems to be here at first, at least telling us what to think, what not to think, what is behind the presentation of other characters. This narrator is also intrusive. He's addressing us directly just as Hardy has done. In the first chapter, he says to us, describing the cob on which Sarah stands, I exaggerate, perhaps, but I can be put to the test for the cob has changed very little since the year of which I write. His direct address to his to us here, punctures that fourth wall, as we say in drama, just as Hardy's narrator does when he zooms out of the action and addresses us. So there are other ways in which this novel of 1969 appears to be an exact copy of a Victorian novel. Hardy includes epigraphs, for example, the little quotations at the beginning of the chapters, as indications of how we should be reading the forthcoming chapter. These epigraphs are all from the Victorian era, and the first one is indeed from Hardy himself, as some of you have noticed. Tellingly, it is a poem called The Riddle, important because the character goes on to, sorry, the chapter goes on to introduce the three characters which comprise the story, but he leaves the central character, Sarah, a riddle for us to solve. So the novel is also committed to psychological realism, just as the Victorian novelists tend to do. Characters and motivations are sketched carefully, backfilling what we understand about the characters. He gives us frank judgments on each character. Of Charles, he says, laziness was, I am afraid, Charles's distinguishing trait. Of Mrs. Pulteney and Mrs. Fairley, Fowles as narrator wastes no time in declaring his hatred of them. He says, um, in short, both women were incipient sadists and it was to their advantage to tolerate each other. Of Mrs. Pulteney particularly, Fowles is absolutely savage. She was like some plump vulture, endlessly circling in her endless leisure. Of Sarah, Fowles' narrator seems to give us permission to see her up close, better than any of the other characters. He says, Sarah was intelligent, uncanny. She had the ability to classify other people's worth. 
to understand them in the fullest sense of that word. Fowles' omniscient narrator gives himself permission to know more than a mere observer of the action. He gives us a psychological motive well beyond what is clear to other characters. In two consecutive chapters, I hope you can see what I mean here, we have both Ernestina and Charles carefully constructing their public selves in front of mirrors. He says, Charles winked at himself in the mirror and then suddenly put a decade on his face, all gravity, the solemn young paterfamilias, then smiled indulgently at his own face and euphoria, posed, was plunged in affectionate contemplation of his features. So we're taken behind the scenes, so to speak, and we're allowed to see omnisciently the falsity of the faces Charles presents to everybody else. And Fowles does the same with Ernestina. In her room, he writes, in her room that afternoon, she unbuttoned her dress, which of course is symbolic. She unbuttoned her dress and stood before her mirror in her chemise and petticoats. For a few moments, she became lost in a highly narcissistic self-contemplation. She was really very pretty one of the prettiest girls she knew. She imagined herself for a truly sinful moment as some wicked person, a dancer, an actress. So the mirrors set up a symbolic pattern here as if to alert us that what the characters present to each other is the projected self crafted to satisfy Victorian morals, but we're allowed to see beyond that crafted self. So, so far, this is a Victorian habit, this notion that the author is given godlike permissions to go beyond what we can normally know of a person. And yet, just as quickly, Fowles destabilizes this easy sense of knowing. As he reminds us, he is from a time when the authority of the author has come under pressure. He compares himself to the Victorians quite explicitly in the extraordinary chapter 13. He writes, if I have pretended until now to know my characters' minds and innermost thoughts, it is because I am writing in, just as I have to assume some of the vocabulary and voice of, a convention universally accepted at the time of my story, that the novelist stands next to God. He may not know all, yet he tries to pretend that he does. But I live in an age of Alain Robb-Grier, I can't say that, and Roland Barthes, says Fowles. For those of you who have missed this, Roland Barthes wrote a particularly influential essay called The Death of the Author, released in exactly the year that this is released, um, wherein he argued that we cannot import an author's intent onto a text, but as readers we can only deal with what is in front of us. So if the Victorians were godlike, says Fowles, I am not a god and may or may not be misleading you. And if we look very carefully we can see this agenda to destabilise omniscient authorship very early on. In Chapter 1, Fowles lets us, lets us see quite easily what Ernestina and Charles are wearing. But Sarah, interestingly, remains ambiguous. Listen carefully to this final paragraph of Chapter 1. But where the telescopist would have been at sea himself was with the other figure on that sombre, curving mole. It stood right at the seawardmost end, apparently leaning against an old cannon barrel upended as a bollard. Its clothes were black. The wind moved them, but the figure stood motionless, staring, staring out to sea, more like a living memorial to the ground, a figure from a myth than a proper fragment of, of that petty provincial day. Now, if you read closely and carefully, we can see that Fowles deliberately gives us nothing on Sarah. He's deliberately vague. Sarah is only a figure. She is only apparently leaning on the bollard. Even her gender is indeterminate. Its clothes were black. She's only spoken of, spoken of in simile like a living memorial to suggest that her true self cannot be aimed at. She is a figure from a myth. Even the image of the telescopist and the spy introduced in that first chapter, reminds us that what we know is limited by what we can see. The edges of the telescope focuses us and shuts out what we cannot get at, and Sarah is what we cannot get at. When the stories about her are told, we are only given her name as a possessive, the French lieutenant's woman. And it is that vague possessive that denies us any access to the truth of who Sarah really is, if she is anything at all. The evasiveness of her name is a symbol of that central evasion of her true character. So 
When Charles comes across Sarah at the Ware Commons and he finds her asleep, Fowles does the same thing with Charles. He refuses him access to Sarah's true self, just like us. He is Fowles again, let me read it to you. And there below him, he saw a figure. Note that, as before, Sarah is not even called a person, but that indeterminate figure, that word comes up again and again. Charles here becomes a kind of symbol for the curious reader, wanting to know more, wanting to pin down the truth of characters internally and externally. Fowles tells us that Charles hesitated. He was about to withdraw, but then his curiosity drew him forward again. As Charles comes closer, her features become both clearer and more frustratingly, here's that word again, indeterminate. A strong nose, heavy eyebrows. The mouth he could not see. It irked him strangely that he had to see her upside down, since the land would not allow him to pass round for the proper angle. Here, that land that would not allow him to pass becomes a kind of symbol for the ways in which we are not allowed to know Sarah, who she really is. Despite seeing her upside down, Fowles tells us that Charles becomes convinced of a certainty of the innocence of this creature, of her being unfairly outcast. So we have Charles there um, telling us exactly what he sees, even if, he, even if he can't see her clearly. So I need you to think about how we're being positioned here, because that's really important, of how we're being asked to read those symbols. We see Charles's limited view as a symbol of his inability to see Sarah truly. And when he pronounces his, her innocence, his upside down view of Sarah is a warning to us that he is perhaps wrong. But before we get cocky and think we know more than Charles, remember this, we are viewing Charles, viewing Sarah. And so Fowles' demonstration of Charles's limitedness in knowledge is immediately a sign of our own limitedness, our own um, failure, I suppose, to get beyond the telescope of what Fowles gives us. And all of this prepares us for the extraordinary chapter 13, where Fowles comes completely out of the story, exactly like a Victorian narrator would, to denounce his own authority, quite unlike a Victorian narrator. He reminds us that his story is fiction, that in some ways he's just at the mercy of his own fiction as we are reading it. And at the end of chapter 12, he confronts us with the figure of Sarah again. Who is Sarah, he asks. Out of what shadows does she come? And then in chapter 13, he answers us, I do not know. This story I am telling is all imagination. He then regales us with a, seri a series of hypotheticals. So perhaps I am writing a transposed autobiography. Perhaps I now live in one of the houses I have brought into the fiction. Perhaps Charles is myself disguised and so on. This repetition of perhaps, perhaps, perhaps reminds us that what we're looking at, we can't actually transcend. We can't actually get beyond to find the truth. And so what Fowles finally does with the character of Sarah is to draw out our interest in her to make us want to know her, just like Charles does, only to frustrate our ability to know her completely. And this narrative technique draws into full focus, not Sarah as character, but our own authoritarian impulse to lazily someone up, lazily sum someone up. So to conclude, I'd like to confirm my point that Fowles is drawing into question our authoritarian impulse to know characters and to pretend we are God along with the author, with a little vignette that perfectly captures his point. It's a funny moment, and I actually laughed out loud when I read it. Ernestina is reading poetry to Charles, and I think that poetry is actually symbolic of literature in and of itself. She's reading poetry to Charles, and she reads his face to assume that the poetry is having a magnificent effect on him. It says, Ernestina's eyes flick bravely to Charles. His eyes are shut as if he is picturing to himself the tragic scene, he nods solemnly, he is all ears. At this point, we believe the narrator that Charles is greatly moved by the poetry recitation. Ernestina keeps reading and looks up again. His eyes are still closed, but he is clearly too moved even to nod. So Ernestina keeps reading until finally, here I'm reading again, a silence. Charles's face is like that of a man at a funeral. Another breath, 
and a fierce glance from the reader. Charles! The poem suddenly becomes a missile, which strikes Charles a glancing blow, blow on the shoulder and lands on the floor behind the sofa. Charles has been asleep. Fowles here uses what I will call free indirect discourse. It's borrowed from the best of the Romantic writers and the best of the Victorian writers, and it's where the omniscient narrator sinks into the characters into a character's consciousness and starts to narrate from that consciousness, only to vault right out of it, as if to remind us to be careful about what we pay attention to. So when we hear he is clearly too moved even to nod, we think we are hearing Fowles' authority on the matter, that Charles is indeed moved by the poetry. When we come to that last moment, when we realise that Charles has in, in fact been asleep the whole time, we realise we have not heard Fowles at all, but Ernestina's belief that, we are, that, that Charles was moved, that he is solemn, that he is all ears. Those are Ernestina's words. What free indirect discourse does is remind us that we are always constructed and swayed by perspective. We never saw to truly omniscient heights. What we think we know is always framed by whoever is telling the story, just as, we, just as what we thought was Charles's true response is in fact Ernestina's faulty reading of her fiancé. So be careful, says Fowles, to what because what you read into my characters may not be, in fact, what is there. For you might be reading the truth, or you might not. Your perspective is all you have.